Pokemon Legends Arceus is the best Breath of the Wild sequel released in 2022. And like most Pokemon games, Magikarp is one of the Pokemon you can catch. But as the games tell you themselves, Magikarp is horribly weak, pathetic, a feeble, pitiful imbecile of a Pokemon, and the most weak and pathetic Pokemon in the world. And because of how weak they are, challenge runs using them have become quite popular. But although some people have done challenges like beating Legends Arceus with only a Rowlet or only using Shinies, nobody seems to have tried beating it using only a Magikarp yet. So I decided to be the one who'd find out if it was possible, and tried beating Pokemon Legends Arceus using only a Magikarp. Before we get into things, let me lay out the rules I set up for this playthrough. First, my party for every battle must include only one single Magikarp. This is the main rule, obviously. I have to take down every opponent with only a Magikarp by my side. And this isn't an Alpha Magikarp or anything either, this is being done using a single, regular Magikarp. I'm allowed to have other Pokemon in my party when I'm out catching stuff, but I can't enter battles with them, and I have to remove them from the party immediately when I go back to a camp. This just makes it so I don't have to run back to a camp every two seconds, since you do a lot of catching outside of battles in this game. Also, glitches that skip parts of the story aren't allowed, but I am allowing small glitches that don't skip the story. This rule is mostly in place to let me get the Magikarp as soon as possible, and I'll explain how soon. Finally, finding lost satchels is allowed, but all other multiplayer features are banned. No trading or anything is allowed. This challenge must be completed using only a single copy of the game. With that out of the way, let's get started. After waking up in the Mystery Zone, Arceus stole my phone and sent me back in time. I named my character Ancient Red, because it's the male character in Ancient Times. <laughs> After catching the professor's Pokemon and having an entire civilization make fun of my t-shirt, I was tasked with catching some more Pokemon to see if I was worthy of joining the Galaxy team. After being force-fed some potatoes, I got to pick my starter. I couldn't get my hands on a Magikarp until I was out in the fields, so I decided to get through the tutorial battles with a Cyndaquil. Volo challenged me by the town entrance, so unfortunately I had to do that battle using Cyndaquil. And once I made it out into the fields, I also had to use Cyndaquil to battle a Shinx. But those are actually the only two battles I have to do before I can get a Magikarp. So after watching a grown man throw a child across his office, I headed back out to the fields and prepared to start the adventure proper. To get to the area where I can catch Magikarp, I had to cross a bridge. The problem was that in order to get across it, I had to complete enough research tasks to gain one rank in the Galaxy team. But I don't play by those rules. I headed east along the shore, and eventually reached this spot. This river is normally too wide to cross on your own at this point in the game, which is why you need the bridge, but there's a way to get around that. I threw the Pokemon I had into the water like this, and I was now able to run at them and basically use them as stepping stones. Doing this gives me a little more distance than I'd usually get, which let me get to the other side of the river earlier than I'm supposed to. You can even see when the map's open. Akari was still teaching me what research tasks were, and I'd managed to get to an area that requires you to have completed several of them. And now that I had access to this area earlier than I was supposed to, I was able to head to the southeastern end of the island and catch a Magikarp. And with the Magikarp caught, the journey was truly underway. After catching the Magikarp, I teleported back to camp and added it to my party, and removed everyone else. Because I'd gotten Magikarp in an area I wasn't supposed to be able to get to yet, its level was higher than the rest of my team, yet every single stat besides speed was still worse than Cyndaquil's. This was clearly going to be a very fun adventure. Now if you've seen people do Magikarp challenge runs for other games in the series, you might be familiar with some of the techniques people use. For example, in every game since the first generation, Magikarp learns Tackle at level 15. And in many of the games it can learn other moves too, like Flail and Hydro Pump. These moves give it some decent options for attacking despite its stats. So what moves can Magikarp learn in this game? None! At all! <laughs> it doesn't even learn Tackle, which has been part of its moveset in every single generation. In this game, Magikarp can only ever know Splash, which is useless. So to attack with him, you need to drop the PP on Splash to zero so he starts using Struggle, a weak attack that also deals recoil damage. There's no other way to attack enemy Pokémon. Obviously, this meant that it was in my best interest to use Magikarp as little as possible, but I still had to keep him leveled up for mandatory fights. I decided to head to the southwestern area of the map and catch things there. They're stronger than the Pokémon elsewhere, so they give Magikarp more experience. Catching all these Pokémon for levels also allowed me to complete research tasks so I could progress the story. After having Akari teach me about the tasks I just spent time strategically ignoring, I completed some of them and reached the first star rank to progress the story. These research tasks just involve doing basic tasks involving Pokemon in the Pokedex. Catch multiples of them, see them use certain moves, and so on. So catching a ton of Pokemon was an easy way to complete them. Before I could leave town again though, Akari and I had to get more potatoes shoved down our throats. On a less important note, I also had to do a mandatory battle against her. This was my first battle using Magikarp. Since Magikarp is a pure water type, only grass and electric moves are super effective against it. What Pokemon does Akari use? Pikachu, an electric type. Fortunately though, you're allowed to lose this battle. There's definitely no way I'd be able to stall for 40 turns to drain Splash's PP with a Pikachu firing off super effective moves, so this was very lucky for me. Apparently Pikachu still doesn't like Akari though, despite her actually leading him to victory, something that probably doesn't happen in most playthroughs. After that, I headed back into the Fieldlands. Now that I'd hit the first star rank, I was able to cross the bridge legitimately to get to the island where I caught Magikarp. 
However, there's a mandatory battle against Warden Mai on the other side of the bridge, so I couldn't actually continue into that area without defeating her. And yes, unlike the Ikari battle, you do actually have to win this one. As you'll remember, I can't attack at all until I use Splash 40 times to drop its PP to zero, where Magikarp will start using Struggle. So I ran off to find a Bidoof to waste Splash's PP on. These Bidoof will either use Rollout or do nothing. Because these Bidoof are merciful to those who would dare cross them, they do nothing more often than they use Rollout. So I was able to slowly whittle down Splash's PP, healing Magikarp when his HP eventually got too low. At one point, it ended up fainting to a critical hit as Bidoof's patience began to fade away, but in this game, you're actually allowed to keep moving after your team faints. Back at camp, I specifically chose not to rest and fully heal for free, and grabbed a revive instead. This is because in this challenge, I actually want to fully heal Magikarp as little as possible. Taking a rest completely restores both his HP and PP, which meant I had to avoid doing that as much as possible. As you can imagine, this meant potions and revives were important for draining Splash's PP. After I eventually drained Splash's PP, I saved the game. If you lose a trainer battle, you automatically get fully healed, which would restore all of Splash's PP. But now that I'd saved, I could just reload my file if I lost and keep struggle active. After that, I entered the battle with Mai. She only has one Pokemon, a Munchlax, and it's level 10. Magikarp was already level 18, so I thought that I'd definitely be able to do this as long as I healed. So I clicked struggle to start my attack. So yeah, for some reason, every struggle missed Munchlax, and this was consistent. Across five attempts at the battle, it didn't land a single time. And I also noticed that it didn't even say Magikarp missed or that Munchlax avoided the attack. Munchlax always did some kind of dodge animation, but the text never mentioned it. At first, I thought that maybe Struggle had just been nerfed in this game so that it didn't damage the opponent, but then I tried fighting a wild Pokemon and it worked just fine. For some reason, the Struggle was just missing the Munchlax specifically. My next idea was that Legends Arceus is a new type of Pokemon game with new mechanics, and so maybe Munchlax was actually just taking zero damage from the attack for some reason. It seemed strange, but I didn't have any other ideas, so I decided to do some leveling. At first, I headed for the southeastern area of the map, because like I mentioned before, a bunch of really powerful things are over there. I had managed to catch some stuff over there earlier to gain one level and complete some tasks, but doing actual dedicated training there didn't go so well. I considered going back to the area I couldn't legitimately access yet to do some training, but now that I had my Magikarp, pulling other Pokemon out of the box to do glitches that I couldn't do using Magikarp felt unfair. So instead, I decided to head for Floro Gardens in the northwestern area of the map. In this area, I can catch Beautifly. These are around level 20 and give around 300 to 400 experience per catch. So essentially, although the other area would technically give more experience per catch, catching Beautifly was more consistent, which led to faster leveling. Like I mentioned before, in this game you don't have to battle most things to catch them, so I made sure that I didn't. I did all of my training by sneaking around and catching them without battling. Whenever you leave an area and return to the village, the Pokemon in the area respawn, so I went back and forth between the village and the fieldlands to catch the Beautifly. I also picked up items and materials during each trip. This let me build up my money and items to keep a consistent stock of Pokeballs to catch with, while also building up a stock of potions to use later. I decided to gain 10 levels, raising Magikarp to level 28. I figured that if Struggle still wasn't landing at level 28, 18 levels higher than Munchlax, then Magikarp's level probably wasn't the issue. I drained Splash's PP, went back to Mai, and... Nothing changed! <laughs> I reset the game and tried the battle one more time for the heck of it, expecting nothing to be different. But instead, this happened. It actually connected, but it also still missed more often than it hit. In other words, a struggle just decided to miss the Munchlax the vast majority of the time for seemingly no reason. But that meant that with enough patience, I would be able to win the battle using struggle. And that meant that the strategy I had to use was simple but tedious. Basically, I had to use a potion every single turn to heal until Munchlax used a move that gave Magikarp two turns in a row. Once it did, I used one of the turns to heal, and used the other one to throw out a struggle. Most of the time, the struggle missed, and the process continued. This strategy did eventually work, but just to give you an idea of the odds I'm talking about here, let me break it down for you. In the attempt where I won the battle, I used struggle 12 times. Out of all of those, 9 missed and 3 hit. In other words, only 25% of the struggles actually connected. 25% might not sound too bad until you remember that I only got a chance to use struggle when I got two turns in a row, which I usually didn't. Most of the time, I had to spend every turn healing. I entered the battle with 87 potions and ended it with 61. In other words, the battle took 26 potions, 38 turns, and almost 7 minutes. And that doesn't even include the many failed attempts. As you might expect, after hours of training and preparing items for the fight, and almost an hour of attempts at the fight, beating it gave me the kind of satisfaction I usually get from beating difficult bosses in other games. Except that this was a level 10 Munchlax. So the adventure was certainly off to a promising start.
Climbing the mountain a bit, I reached the summit, where an alpha cricketune was waiting. At this point, Mai and the professor decided that they wanted to taunt me and make fun of me. Mai fully healed Magikarp, restoring all 40 PP to Splash, and the professor said that if I had to fight the Cricketune, then I should make sure my Pokemon had powerful moves at its disposal. That was really cool of him to say, considering all zero options I had. Since Mai healed Magikarp, I had to run back down the mountain, drain Splash's PP again, and then head back up. And remember, the video you're watching now is cut up to keep things moving quickly for you, but for me, draining Splash's 40 PP took almost 10 minutes every time. So you can see why it's something I wanted to try and avoid. Now that Splash's PP was drained, I faced off against the Alpha Cricketune, pressed fight, and... They healed it again! <laughs> Turns out that not only does the cutscene heal you, but starting the battle also heals you again. That sucked. You might be thinking that my next step should have been to try draining Splash's PP against the Cricketune itself while healing with potions, but unfortunately that wasn't going to be an option either. Cricketune has Absorb, a grass-type move that's super effective against Magikarp. Not only that, but it can use Absorb in Agile Style, which lets it immediately attack again using another Absorb. Even with the lower power of Agile Style moves, there's no way for Magikarp to survive two Absorbs in a row. So after barely scraping through Mai's battle, I had already hit another wall 10 minutes later. I wasn't ready to give up though, the adventure had only just begun. So I ran past the Cricketune and headed all the way to the eastern edge of the map. Why? Because the upper cliffs on this side of the map have some super powerful Pokemon on them. You're not supposed to be able to get up here until you get your first Pokemon mount, but that wasn't going to stop me. When you try to walk up a slope that's too steep, your character will stumble backwards after a few seconds, making it impossible to get higher than you're supposed to. But if you take damage from a Pokemon's attack during the stumbling animation, your character can suddenly move around at super speed until they leave the ground again, and their running animations become a little screwed up while this is in effect. By getting hit while on this slope, I was able to run up the slope too quickly for my character to stumble again, which allowed me to reach this area way earlier than I was supposed to. Like I mentioned, the reason I wanted to get up here is because there's powerful Pokemon up here. The most notable one is Alpha Blissey, which is arguably the single best thing to catch or battle for levels later on, but I wasn't able to catch it this early on. However, there are still other Pokemon up here that are stronger than elsewhere. I managed to catch a Chansey, which got me one level, but since I only had the basic Pokeballs, I couldn't end up catching anything else and ended up leaving. Cool that I managed to get up there, but not as helpful as I'd hoped. And that was when I realized that I'd done something pretty dumb. I had started to resign myself to the fact that I need to do another insane level grinding session to gain the levels Magikarp needed to survive against Absorb, and that was why I tried to speed up the process by getting to Blissey's area of the map. But as I came to terms with the fact that I might have to spend several more hours in the gardens with Beautifly, I decided to check out some other Legends Arceus challenge videos to see how they approach this fight. And in one of them, the player just caught the Cricketune and ended the fight that way. Trying to catch it didn't cross my mind even once, but after all the worrying I'd done, I headed back to the battle and caught it in the very first Pokeball I threw. After choking on some more potatoes and watching an Ace Attorney trial, I headed back to the Fieldlands once again. Before I could reach the game's first major boss Pokemon, because somehow Munchlax didn't count, I had to win another battle, this time against Warden Leon. Before I could fight Leon, though, I had to drain Splash's PP again. At first I tried to do this against Pokemon that were near Leon. This didn't work very well, and this situation should help demonstrate just how pathetic Magikarp is. I entered a battle against a Psyduck that was 15 levels below Magikarp. It used Water Pulse, a water-type move which was not very effective, and it took out half of Magikarp's HP. I decided I'd continue to drain Splash's PP with the Shinx in the early area for now. After finishing up and heading back to Leon, I faced off against his one Pokemon, a Gumi. My very first struggle connected, which made me think that Munchlax was the only one that was able to do the weird dodge to avoid them. I quickly found that I actually just had a lucky start, and Gumi dodged struggle the exact same way Munchlax did. The strategy for this battle was similar to the Munchlax one, but a little different. Gumi never gave me two turns in a row, but still attacked just as hard as Munchlax, which meant I had to be healing every single turn I got. My only opening was when it used Acid Armor. It seemed to want to keep its defensive stats raised at all times, so whenever the Acid Armor buff wore off and its stats returned to normal, I had one turn where I could use Struggle while it used Acid Armor. The problem was that usually, when its defense went back to normal, it had already knocked my HP really low with the previous attack, so I couldn't risk attacking it because it might decide not to use Acid Armor and go for the KO instead. I attempted the fight a few times and lost, but then I got lucky. On one attempt, about half of Magikarp's HP was gone when Gumi's defense buff wore off, but I decided to risk the attack anyway to see what would happen. Amazingly, Magikarp landed a critical hit and knocked it out in one attack, and with that, Leon was defeated. After I defeated Leon, the professor figured out a way to calm down the noble Pokemon Cleaver, so I was almost able to fight it. But back in the fields, I got the first mountain Pokemon, Weirdeer. 
Weird Deer lets you run way faster than normal and leap high into the air. This is obviously convenient at a basic level, since it makes getting around much faster, but it also provides one massive advantage for the challenge. Earlier I had to use a glitch to get up to where the high level Pokemon like Blissey were. Since the glitch I used was so finicky, it wasn't really feasible to go up there repeatedly to gain levels. With Weird Deer, however, I can now jump up to that area, giving me easy access to one of the best areas in the game for experience before I'd even defeated the first Noble. And this was actually more helpful than you might think, because before I could go fight Cleaver, I also had to do one more trainer battle against Prosecutor Irita so the more levels I could get, the better. Since I still only had access to regular Pokeballs, catching things up here was inconsistent, but it still gave far, far more experience than anywhere else. Enough of a difference that it was worth dealing with the inconsistency. I knew this spot would be even better later on if I could catch the Alpha Blissey, but at this early point in the game, I had no idea if I'd even be able to make it that far. After catching things there for a while, I got 11 levels for Magikarp and got it to level 40. You might feel like that's a bit overkill for this early in the game, even for a Magikarp challenge, but there's a very specific reason I decided to do that that I'll explain soon. I also picked up items and sold them as I trained, which not only let me continue getting Pokeballs for the catching, but also let me get tons of potions for the future. After I finished leveling Magikarp up, I headed back to camp and started releasing the Pokemon I'd caught so far. I had almost four and a half boxes full, and after releasing all of them, I ended up with 51 Grit Rocks, 57 Grit Gravels, and 7 Grit Pebbles. These items let me boost the effort values of a Pokemon's stats, basically a small permanent boost. Every stat can be boosted up to level 10. Using just the grit items I'd gotten from releasing Pokemon, I was able to get every stat to a level 6 boost, and I got a few of them beyond that. Once I'd boosted as much as I could, I headed back to the village. There's a character here named Zisu, and using her I was able to get my hands on a few more grit items, letting me boost Magikarp's stats a little bit more. Here's what it looked like after all that. It still wasn't incredible, but it was at least an improvement. After that, I headed back to the Fieldlands and fought a Shinx to drain Splash's BP again. I was surprised to see that when Magikarp got attacked, it hardly took any damage. Considering the massive level difference between them, it might seem a little silly that I was surprised by that, but Magikarp had been taking decent damage from everything so far, regardless of their level, so this felt like the first noticeable improvement. Finally, it was starting to get better. After all of that, I challenged Dorita. Her Glaceon uses Swift a lot, and even after all that training, it was still dealing a massive amount of damage with every hit. Combined with the recoil damage Magikarp took from Struggle, things would go badly very fast. And as usual, Struggle would miss the Glaceon almost every time. After a few failed attempts, I ended up using the same strategy I used to defeat Munchlax. I healed every turn until I got two in a row, and then I threw out an attack alongside the heal. Also, a few turns into the battle on each attempt, Glaceon started using a combo where it would use Quick Attack, and then follow up with Swift to do even more damage. It would continue doing this combo every turn once it started. Depending on how much HP Magikarp had before she did one of those, sometimes I'd have to waste one of my two turn openings to heal twice in a so I could survive. I could have used one of the two super potions I'd gotten, but I was holding onto those for a specific reason. Also, on the rare occasions where Struggle did connect, it took out just under half of Glaceon's HP, which meant it would take three hits to take it out. Luckily though, on one attempt I got a critical hit, which meant I only needed to hit it twice to win. With the strategy I was using, I didn't feel like the critical hit was necessary, but it definitely made things easier. With that, I took out the Glaceon, and Arita was defeated. Now it was finally time for the fight against the noble Pokemon Cleaver. Considering that this is one of the major bosses that gets marked on your save file, you might think it would be a really hard fight, but this is actually the easiest battle in the game so far. Why? because for the noble fights, you only have to use your own character. By dodging out of the way and throwing bombs at the Pokemon, you bring down its strength. Using your own Pokemon in these battles is entirely optional. So, with Magikarp sealed deep within my bag, I exclusively used my human character and won the battle on my first try, a very nice change of pace from how things had usually been so far. After that, I headed back to town. While there, I grabbed a set of Great Balls and Max Revives from the merchant whose inventory changes. After reporting to the commander and having more potatoes forced on me, I went back to the Fieldlands. With a few more catches, I was able to complete enough research tasks to reach the second rank in the Galaxy team, which would allow me to access the next area and progress the story. But before I handed over my Pokedex and got my rank, I made absolutely sure to save, and made absolutely sure not to save again until I was outside of the village. I'll explain why soon. After getting my second star and being approved to head to the Crimson Mirelands, I headed for the town entrance where Akari was waiting for me. This is the reason I decided to level all the way up to 40, why I wanted to hold on to my super potions, and why I made absolutely sure not to save until I was able to leave town again. Akari challenges you to a battle here, and you can't turn her down. The obvious problem with this is that it's inside the village. I couldn't fight anything to drain Magikarp's PP. Also, she has two Pokemon this time, and one of them is still Pikachu, which still has super effective moves against Magikarp. The reason I wanted to make sure not to save here was because you're not allowed to lose this battle, so you're stuck here until you defeat her. If I couldn't defeat her at level 40, I'd be completely trapped and the playthrough would be over. But since I didn't save, I could just reset the game and go train some more if I had to. Or, at least, I thought you weren't allowed to lose, but she defeated me quickly and the story continued just fine. In retrospect, of course they wouldn't allow a softlock that would trap any weak team in the town. 
I'm really not sure why I thought you had to win this one. But I definitely wasn't complaining about having Magikarp at level 40. I decided that from this point on, I'd try losing every battle before fighting it seriously to see which ones let you continue the story that way. After all, if I didn't have to spend time draining Splash's PP and dealing with constant healing, I didn't want to. With Akari out of the way, I headed out to the Crimson Mirelands. In the Crimson Mirelands, I started by heading to the ruins where I spoke to Warden Kalava. Volo appeared and challenged me, but as it turned out, you can lose this one too. So I threw the match with pleasure. <laughs> But after that, I had to go and fight Bandit Coin, one of the thieves who stole a fragment from the ruins. Unfortunately, you're not allowed to lose this battle, so I had to drain Splash's PP again. However, now that I was in a new area, I couldn't do that so easily against Shinx anymore. Whenever you switch between areas, your team gets fully healed. That meant that I had to drain Splash's PP against Pokemon in this new area, which were obviously stronger than the ones in the Fieldlands. That made the process a bit harder, but I managed it. After that, I headed back to the bandits. Something I realized around this point is that I could hit most trainers' Pokemon with Struggle just fine. It was specifically the Pokemon owned by Wardens and the clan leaders that dodged it. I don't really know why that is, but that was true for this battle. I could hit Toxicroak with Struggle just fine. On the downside though, Toxicroak was very powerful. Taking a hit from it knocked out more HP than a potion could heal, meaning that every time I healed, I was basically breaking even or losing HP each time. There wasn't really any way for me to attack, considering it didn't give me two turn openings, and its attacks were too powerful for me to outpace with healing. I tried the fight a few more times and couldn't beat it, so I decided to explore the area and catch things. I'd eventually need to get my Galaxy team rank up to progress the story, so I decided to work on that for a while to get it out of the way, since it would also get Magikarp some more experience at the same time anyway. The stuff here didn't give me as much experience as the good area in the Fieldlands, but it was more of a kill two birds with one stone situation. After exploring the area for quite a while, I eventually completed enough research tasks to reach the third star rank. To complete the game you need to reach the fifth star rank at minimum, so I figured I'd probably just do a big exploration session to go up a rank each time I got to a new area. With all the catching I did on my way to the third rank, Magikarp gained two levels and got up to level 42. I decided to try the bandit fight again, but I still couldn't beat it. Two things became clear very quickly. I needed to gain more levels, and super potions were now basically a necessity. With the amount of damage Toxicroak was dealing every turn, regular potions were barely keeping Magikarp alive, even with the extra levels. The regular potions just weren't cutting it anymore. Luckily, by grabbing three pieces of hardy wheat, I was able to complete a side quest back in town that added new items to the shop lineup. Among those new items are super potions. I spent all of my money on them and sold my regular potions to grab a few more. Then I headed back to the Mirelands and decided to continue doing research tasks out there. Since I still needed to gain more levels, I thought I might as well keep working towards the ranks that would be necessary later on. After doing that for a while, Magikarp hit level 44. During this session, I also released a bunch of Pokemon, which got me several more grit items I was able to use to boost Magikarp stats even further. I managed to get HP all the way up to level 10. I also entered a space-time distortion, which got me some valuable items I was able to sell. I wanted to get Magikarp to level 45, but as its level rises, the amount of experience it gets for each catch gets lower, and the amount of experience it needs to level up gets higher. So the process of training it up started to become very slow and very tedious. I ended up settling for level 44. Thankfully, I had much better luck getting money than I had with leveling. I managed to get 125 super potions, and I still had almost 15,000 Poké Dollars on me for later, so I decided to try the fight again. It soon became obvious that I couldn't approach this fight the same way I had approached the previous trainer battles. Even after leveling Magikarp up four times, Venoshock still did almost half of Magikarp's HP in a single hit, which meant I was never allowed to not heal up. Also, I never really got chances to move twice in a row like I had in previous battles. In this entire battle, which lasted over 30 turns, it only happened once, so it wasn't really reasonable to wait for that to happen. Instead, I decided that if I had to heal every turn, then I'd just heal every turn. Just like Magikarp Splash, Venoshock only had so much PP. So if I kept Magikarp alive, eventually Toxicroak would run out of PP for Venoshock and would start using moves that were weaker. This strategy worked perfectly, and after it ran out of PP for Venoshock, I was able to defeat it while it fought back with very weak attacks. And so, hours later, I'd finally beaten her. My next objective was to battle a Pokemon called Ursaluna. Fortunately, they didn't do any stupid garbage like heal my Magikarp, so I was able to head directly to its area to start the fight. That's where the positives end though, because this fight was super annoying. Ursaluna used baby doll eyes to lower Magikarp's offense, and did this again every time it returned to normal. Magikarp is already weak as is, so the lowered offense meant Struggle's damage was just pitiful. Ursaluna is also pretty bulky, so even when Magikarp's offense wasn't lowered, Struggle was still pathetic. And on top of that, Ursaluna's own attacks were powerful. Just like Toxicroak, its attacks took out about half of Magikarp's HP, which meant I had to heal at every opportunity. And unlike the Cricketoon in the Fieldlands, you aren't allowed to catch this thing. You have to defeat it. Thankfully, it used moves that let me move twice in a row fairly often, so I was able to whittle down its HP. Eventually though, it ran out of PP for Slash, and started using different moves. And on top of still dealing big damage, these moves didn't give me chances to go twice in a row, so I had to spend all of my turns healing. Luckily though, its attacks missed every so often, which gave me chances to attack, and so I managed to defeat it. And I was very glad to not have to do more training. 
yet. <laughs> However, I was legitimately starting to wonder how far the playthrough could possibly go. Magikarp was already 21 levels higher than Toxicroak and 16 levels higher than Ursaluna, and even still the wins were hard fought and slow. How was I going to manage when trainers started having huge teams? After winning, I headed back to town, and then I had to find a fellow victim of the Potato Onslaught back in the Mirelands. After finding her, it was time for a fight against Lilligant, the next noble Pokemon. Like with Cleaver, there's no need to use Magikarp for this fight, so I did it without him and it was pretty easy. And with that, Magikarp had, somehow, made it through the second area of the game. After being threatened into eating more potatoes, I went to sleep. Now that I had completed the second area, I'd unlocked something new, and I'd held on to some of my money in preparation for this. The candy stand had opened, which sells EXP candies. These candies give your Pokémon a bunch of experience at once. Now for any future exploration sessions, I'd be able to earn experience not just from my catches, but from the money I'd collect as well. I hoped that this would make training easier going forward, especially since the candy stand gets better candies as the story progresses. Also, a kid in town wanted to learn about Magikarp, and by showing her the Pokédex entry I'd already completed ages ago, I got a rare candy which raises a Pokémon's level by one. After that, I headed for the Cobalt Coastlands, the third area. Arita challenged me to a battle immediately after I arrived. Thankfully, I didn't have to win, so I lost on purpose and continued. The first thing I did in the coastlands was grab three pop pods on the beach. Back in town, I completed a quest with these, adding more items to the store. Among these items are hyper potions, which meant those were now an option I could go for instead of super potions. After doing that, I decided to work on the lost and found for a while. The lost and found is a feature where, when you get defeated, another player can pick up your bag and send the items you dropped back to you. Each time you pick up a bag, you get some points you can spend. Each bag also has an item marked on it, and sometimes when you find it, you'll get that item on top of the points. So by working at this for a while, I was able to get my hands on rare items like EXP candies and rare candies, as well as stuff that I didn't otherwise have unlocked yet, like Ultra Balls. Plus, you can also exchange 1,000 points for a rare candy, letting me get even more of them. After doing this for an hour or two, while also selling items I found along the way and buying EXP candies back in town, I got Magikarp up to level 51. Once I ran out of bags to find, I hopped back out to the coastlands to collect more items. I did this so I could sell them to the shop and buy more EXP candies. Now that buying EXP candies was an option for me, I wanted to take advantage of it and try gaining a good chunk of levels. There actually aren't too many mandatory battles in this area, but there's a part later on where you have to defeat three trainers in a row, so I wanted to prepare myself for that as best I could. So after a bit of exploring, I managed to get Magikarp one more level to reach level 52. Having now gained seven levels since the Arita fight at the start of the area, I thought it was a good time to start making some progress. Like I mentioned before, this area doesn't have many mandatory battles, so I was able to make progress easily. After catching a Dusclops and cooking up some food, I got the Mount Pokemon Basque Legion, which lets me travel across water. This meant that I could now head to Fire Spit Island, where I had to fight the area's mandatory trainers. So after draining Splash's PP, I headed for the center of the island, where the three bandits were waiting for me. This time, I had to fight all of them in a row. Bandit Clover was up first, and... Even with an advantage of almost 20 levels, Abomasnow's Energy Ball was super effective and destroyed Magikarp in a single hit. And like I mentioned before, you can't lose these battles. You have to defeat all three of the bandits in a row, and if you lose to any of them, you have to start over from the first one. So even with an advantage of almost 20 levels, it was clear that Magikarp wouldn't be winning these battles without gaining more. So, it was back to the grind. After catching tons and tons of stuff in the coastlands, and selling items to buy more EXP candies, I eventually got Magikarp up to level 62, 10 levels above my last attempt at the fight. I also reached rank 4 in the Galaxy team, just one more and I'd be a high enough rank to reach the end of the game. During the training session, I also did a quest where I showed a guy the complete Pokedex entry from a choke, and he gave me an Ox Power Guard. The Ox items in this game are very similar to the X Battle items from the traditional games. They boost a Pokemon's stats sharply for a few turns while in battle. Ox Power Guards in particular boost both offensive and defensive stats for 5 turns. You can gain the ability to craft these items yourself, so I figured they might be useful as the adventure went on. Now that Magikarp had gained 10 more levels, I decided to give the fight another try. Surely this boost would help me stand a better chance. Or maybe not. <laughs> Even 10 levels later, Magikarp still went down in a single hit. Things weren't looking good. I decided to try again, but this time I used the Ox Power Guard on my first turn. To my surprise, this allowed Magikarp to survive an attack. I managed to land an attack of my own, and with the Power Guard's attack boost in effect, this took out over half of Abomina Snow's HP in one go. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to survive long enough to land a second attack. Ox Power Guard's boost had allowed me to survive an Energy Ball, but I couldn't win the entire battle in the 5 turns the boost last for. So even with an advantage of 27 levels, Magikarp still stood no chance against this thing. I had no choice but to continue training. Since I'd already reached rank 4, I decided to focus primarily on farming money this time. 6,000 Poké Dollars would let me buy a medium EXP candy, which would give Magikarp 3,000 experience. Eventually, I found a route through the area that let me pass by several wooden boxes and chests. These contained Pokéballs, Great Balls, and Ultra Balls, and also contained other helpful items like Cakes, which helped make Pokémon easier to catch. Now that I had Cakes and Ultra Balls, I eventually decided to try catching the Alphablissi again, and using Honey Cakes, I actually managed to. 
This gave me thousands of experience points, and it dropped a large EXP candy, which gave me 10,000 more experience on top of that. This was far and away the fastest training method I had. I could buy honey cakes from the store, and I could get Ultra Balls using the route I'd found, so catching Alpha Blissey was now something I could do consistently. So, at long, long last, I finally had a fast training method. It still wasn't 100% consistent of course, but it was much, much faster than any other way I could level. Also, on top of the experience and EXP candies it drops, it can also drop a Seed of Mastery. This item is useless for Magikarp, but it meant I could sell them for 3,000 Poké Dollars each to save up money for items. Also, whenever you release an Alpha Blissey, you get a Grit Rock, the best Grit item. This meant that before long, I finally maxed out all of Magikarp's stats at 10 boosts, and could start selling the Grit Rocks too for an extra 3,000 Poké Dollars for every Blissey. I soon discovered that I could also catch them using Leaden Balls, which I could already craft myself. So instead of farming for Ultra Balls using the route I'd found, I could just buy the materials to craft Leaden Balls. Grit Rocks got me 3,000 Poké Dollars per Blissey, and catching a Blissey got me over 2,000 Poké Dollars from the Professor, so I got over 5,000 Poké Dollars for every Blissey catch at minimum. That was more than enough to buy the cakes and materials I needed to keep the training going, while also buying healing items to help prepare for the battles ahead. Now that I had a good training method, I decided to train my way up to level 75. That was 13 levels above my previous attempt, and 40 levels above Abomasnow. I thought that with an advantage of 40 levels, I'd definitely be able to win this time. But apparently, 13 levels later, Struggle still took out less than half of its HP, and it still took out Magikarp in one hit after the recoil damage. However, I did notice something. On one attempt, Energy Ball missed Magikarp. Every time I started the battle, the turn counter showed that I'd get one turn, then Abomasnow would get one turn, and then I'd get two in a row. That meant that if I kept retrying the battle until it missed its one shot, I would be able to use Struggle three times in a row and win. So I started trying the battle over and over, and eventually I got the luck I needed and the strategy actually worked. Next up was a fight against Bandit Coin, and I'm not joking you here, the Toxicroak missed every single one of its attacks and I beat her on my first try. Bandit Charm was up next. All the leveling I'd done finally made a difference here. Now that Magikarp wasn't getting destroyed by super effective moves, the damage I was taking was small enough that I could actually afford to attack even when I didn't have two turns in a row. I was taking more damage from Struggle's recoil damage than I was from Rhydon's attacks. After I defeated it, she sent out Gengar, and unfortunately, I lost this one. She made Magikarp sleepy using Hypnosis, and now that Magikarp had a status effect, the power of Gengar's Hex attack was multiplied by two. That was enough to take Magikarp out, which meant I had to start from Abomasnow again. But since I'd gotten so close that time, it felt very possible at my current level, so I decided to keep rolling the dice until Abomasnow missed again. Somehow, on my very next attempt, it happened again. When I made it back to Bandit Charm this time, Rhydon went down just as easily as the first time. Once Gengar came out, it started by using Hypnosis to make Magikarp drowsy again, and then I had two turns in a row. I had two turns in a row on my first attempt too, except Gengar had opened with Hex that time, which meant I probably wouldn't have had enough HP to survive two struggles. This time, I was still at full HP, so I decided to use Struggle on both of my turns in a row, and hope that Magikarp wouldn't be too drowsy to move. Somehow, I got the luck I needed, and 23 levels later, I finally started to make some progress again. And believe it or not, that win actually guaranteed that Magikarp had made it through the third area. That was the final trainer battle. Next, I had to fight the noble Pokemon Arcanine, but like the previous ones, as long as I didn't send in Magikarp, I could get through it perfectly fine. After making a pact with Akari to burn down the potato fields that night, I encountered defense attorney Adamin, along with Melly. Adamin challenged me to a battle to show Melly how good I was, but since this was in town and I couldn't use Struggle, I obviously lost. Thankfully, that's allowed, so the story continued. I headed to the fourth area, the Coronet Highlands. I soon encountered Melly again, who forced me to battle him if I wanted to continue. Unfortunately, this fight was one that I was required to win, so I drained Splash's PP and then came back. But as I quickly found out, Melly's Skun Tank was dodgy just like the previous Warden's Pokemon. I'm not sure why this happens with the Warden's Pokemon specifically, but regardless, it meant that I just had to keep trying until struggles eventually landed. This fight was pretty annoying. It used Poison Jab, which would often poison Magikarp. That meant that a lot of the time, Magikarp took recoil damage, poison damage, and damage from Skun Tank's attacks. Plus, even when Skuntank ran out of PP for Poison Jab, it could still use Flamethrower and burn Magikarp for basically the same effect. Fortunately for me though, Skuntank's attacks weren't one-hit KOs or anything like Energy Ball had been, so by just doing the usual strategy of healing frequently and waiting for two turn openings to attack, I managed to win after a few attempts. I used up most of my potions though, so I knew I'd have to farm for more of them soon since in every battle, I was basically spamming them more often than I was attacking. A short while after the Skuntank battle, I got challenged by Warden Ingo. This battle had one major advantage, and one major disadvantage compared to previous Warden battles. On the plus side, even though Ingo was a Warden, his Pokémon didn't dodge Struggle like the other Warden's Pokémon did, making it much easier to land hits when I had openings. But on the downside, Ingo has three Pokémon, and one of them had Energy Ball and could destroy Magikarp in one hit. On my first attempt, that's exactly what happened, and as it turned out, this was another battle that I was required to win. I tried the fight several times, and lost the same way every time. Machoke wasn't hard at all, but Tangela destroys Magikarp instantly. 
I had an attempt where I got close. Tangela always starts with a stun sport, a paralyzed Magikarp, but on one attempt it missed. This gave me a chance to do two struggles, and one of them was a critical hit. This almost defeated Tangela. Plus, since its first stun spore had missed, instead of attacking, it used stun spore again, giving me another turn. Unfortunately, the paralysis prevented Magikarp from moving, and then it got defeated. But even if I had defeated Tangela, the recoil damage from Struggle probably would have knocked out Magikarp as well, and even if that didn't happen, Ingo still had his third Pokemon, and that would have almost definitely taken out the last bit of Magikarp's HP. So despite having an advantage of almost 35 levels, it seemed like at Magikarp's current level, the only way it could possibly defeat Tangela and actually survive the next Pokemon's attack is if Stun Spore missed, and then Magikarp got two critical hits in a row. Not amazing odds, obviously. So after a few more failed attempts, it was time to level grind again. But first, I headed back to town and did another task for the general store, which expanded their stock again. There was now one more task for the store after this one, and that final task has the really good stuff like Ultra Balls and Full Restores. Then I started doing research tasks until I hit rank 5. This was the final rank I needed to beat the game, so I decided to just get it out of the way now. Once I hit rank 5, I decided to grind levels using Blissey some more. This worked for two reasons. First, it would help me raise Magikarp's level, obviously, which was the most important part, but it would also let me build up some money. Like I mentioned earlier, the battle against Melly had used up most of the potions I had left, so I needed to build up a supply of them again. This time though, I decided to take the level grinding a step further. As I said before, Alpha Blissies are, as far as I know, the fastest way to train, and they also earn me a lot of money at the same time. And now I had the ability to make use of that. And while I figured that I could probably defeat Ingo if I gained 10 levels and made it to level 85 or something, I knew for a fact that there was no way I was going to have any chance of beating the entire game without reaching level 100. And since it wasn't like I was going to have a better way to train later on, I thought to myself, why not just get out of the way now? So that's what I did. I caught Blissey after Blissey and used EXP candy after EXP candy, and eventually Magikarp hit level 98. Once it did, I found some drop bags to get merit points, and got two rare candies to finally get Magikarp to level 100. The amount of time it took to get Magikarp to level 100 was just stupid, <laughs> so to finally have it done was super satisfying. However, I soon discovered that even at max level, things still weren't going to be easy. Even at full HP, Energy Ball knocked Magikarp's HP almost to zero, and it didn't seem like I was getting many chances to have two turns in a row. Tangela always started by using Stun Spore, no matter what HP Magikarp had, so I could take a risk and attack early even if it would leave my HP dangerously low. But even if I did do that, as soon as the Energy Balls got started I didn't last long. I did eventually manage to beat it, but even at level 100, with an advantage of 59 levels, the win was entirely dependent on luck. Tangela's Stun Spore missed, which meant Magikarp could move twice in a row, so I just attacked repeatedly. Then, since its first Stun Spore didn't work, it used it again instead of attacking. This let me attack it one more time, and I just barely managed to take it out. But then Magikarp only had 1 HP left, so the Gliscor Ingo sent out next defeated it instantly. Several attempts later, and I had another attempt where Stun Spore missed. This time, I got high rolls on my attacks or something, and I managed to take out Tangela in just two attacks, leaving Magikarp unparalyzed and with much more HP. And Gliscor still beat it in one attack. It was quickly becoming clear that even at level 100, this still wasn't going to work, so I had one final strategy to try. Back in town, I bought the crafting recipes for Ox Powers, Ox Guards, and Ox Power Guards. Ox Powers boost your offensive stats for 5 turns, Ox Guards boost defensive stats for 5 turns, and Ox Power Guards boost both of them for 5 turns. Earlier in the playthrough, I used an Ox Power Guard I got from a quest against Abomasnow. Snow. The defense boost helped Magikarp survive a little longer in my early attempts, so I thought that they might help make a difference against Ingo. After crafting a few of them, I drained Splash's PP and headed back to Ingo. On my first attempt, I started the battle by using a Power Guard. This worked decently well and let me survive attacks and heal up, but once it wore off against Tangela, I didn't last much longer. But I got close enough that this approach was clearly going to work. A few attempts later, and I decided to hold off on using a Power Guard until Tangela got sent out. And then I finally got lucky. Tangela missed its Stun Spore, and Magikarp got a critical hit. Since its attack power was boosted by the Power Guard, the critical hit took out Tangela in one hit. Now that Magikarp was no longer near death, Gliscor was no longer a problem, and with that, I finally beat Ingo. Winning the battle meant I can now use Sneasler to climb walls, and so I was able to head to my next destination, where Melly was waiting to battle me again. This time he used three Pokemon. Along with the Skuntank he had the first time, there's also a Skorupi and a Zubat. Those two aren't very powerful, and I didn't have any super effective moves to worry about, but many of his Pokemon's moves can poison Magikarp. Since I had poison damage and recoil damage to worry about on top of the damage from the Pokemon's actual attacks, I decided to use an Ox Power Guard. This was another annoying fight. They can poison Magikarp, put it to sleep, and attack it for a bunch of damage. On top of that, since it was a Warden's team, Struggle missed most of the time. Plus, regardless of which of his Pokemon I targeted, Magikarp just attacked whichever one it felt like. That meant that I not only had to hope the attacks would connect in the first place, but I also had to hope that Magikarp would choose its targets well, which it didn't. There wasn't really much I could do to change the results here. I just threw myself at the battle over and over, keeping Magikarp healed and making sure the Ox Power Guard buff was active as much as possible. Eventually, I got the luck I needed, and I had an attempt where Magikarp just happened to land enough attacks to defeat them all. 
Like with the Ingo fight, it was pure luck. Even a Magikarp shouldn't normally have trouble beating level 22 Pokemon at level 100, so that should tell you just how often it missed. But on this attempt, I managed to land enough attacks to win the battle with 2 HP left. Again, this battle wasn't really hard, per se. The enemy Pokemon themselves never did any moves that felt impossible to deal with on their own, but trying to land attacks of my own was where the trouble came in. After that, I confronted the area's noble Pokemon, Electrode. You know the drill by now. I kept Magikarp in its Pokeball, threw the bombs, and easily took down the Electrode. And that meant that Magikarp had successfully made it through four of the game's five areas. There was only one left now. After heading back to town, Hikari and I got our punishment for trying to burn down the potato fields. The next day, Komodo sent me off to the fifth and final area, the Alabaster Icelands. At the town's entrance, Akari challenged me to a battle. I tried to decline, and she acted humble, saying that she knows she may not be able to beat me, as if I had beaten her a single time in the entire game. She's getting cocky. <laughs> After watching Magikarp get slapped into the ground by Akari's team and crafting a few more Ox Power Guards, I headed out to the Icelands. In the Icelands, I was challenged by this guy. Unfortunately, you're not allowed to lose this battle, so already I had to drain Splash's PP. That said, I was pretty optimistic I could win. On my first attempt where I wasn't trying so I could see if I was allowed to lose, it took him several turns to defeat Magikarp. So if I was actually trying with struggles and heals, it probably wouldn't be too bad. However, my optimism quickly faded when I remembered that I was, in fact, using a Magikarp. Even with an Ox Power Guard, the Glalie and Frostloss together would attack so many times in a row that I couldn't really keep up. And even though it was a group battle, I once again couldn't choose which of the two of them to target. If I could have chosen to start by taking out the Frostloss, then it would have been easier, but I didn't have that choice. And, as was tradition by this point, since he was a Warden, Struggle would miss all the time too. But I just kept keeping Magikarp healed and buffed, and after several attempts, I eventually managed it on an attempt where Magikarp defeated the level 48 Glalie before the level 24 Frostlass. After that, I had to chase around another Warden, Sabi. After ruining this guy's day and chasing Sabi to Snowpoint Temple, I had to battle with her. This battle was the most intense one yet. Sabi sent out three Pokemon, a Rhyperior, a Magmortar, and an Electrovire. Electrovire was Electric-type, which meant it had a super effective attack against Magikarp. Thankfully, it was only level 30, so it didn't do too much damage. However, with all three of them attacking, I had to heal frequently. The battle was also made extra difficult because I only had two Ox Power Guards left, which meant I could only buff Magikarp for 10 turns. That might seem like plenty, but with three Pokemon to deal with and me having to use most of those turns on healing, it really wasn't. But I didn't want to go and farm for more, so I just gave it a try. Like with the other recent battles, it seemed like things were starting to come down to luck. I just had to try and keep Magikarp healed and hope that it would attack the Pokemon I wanted. But eventually, I had an attempt where Magikarp took out Magmortar early on. I couldn't manage to take out Rhyperior or Electrovire, so I ended up healing repeatedly. Eventually, Electrovire only had PP for Thunder Wave left, which meant all it could do was paralyze Magikarp over and over. Rhyperior could still do decent damage, but it ran out of PP for its best move, so the battle actually got easier the longer it went on for. It was very tedious, and I had to keep Magikarp's HP high at all times to avoid risking a critical hit or something, but finally, after over an hour of repeated attempts, Magikarp defeated Rhyperior with a critical hit, and then since Electrovire only had PP for Thunder Wave and can no longer damage it, it was just a matter of time before Magikarp landed the hit and won. This was definitely the most challenging battle I'd faced so far, but I finally managed it. Immediately after that battle, I headed outside where Sabi threw a bird at me. The Braviary battle was not nearly as intense as the last one was, but it was still annoying. It has an attack called Hurricane, which took out most of Magikarp's HP in one hit, and whenever I started to deal some damage, it would use Roost to heal itself. Although I was able to make it through several turns, I eventually lost my first attempt because there was no way to deal enough damage to outpace Roost without taking some risks, which ended up getting Magikarp killed. I decided to jump back to the camp and grab the Ox Powers and Ox Guards I had left over from earlier. They aren't as efficient as the Power Guards, obviously, since the Power Guard is basically just both of them combined, but I decided to see if these would do the trick since I didn't want to go farm more materials to make Power Guards just yet. Sure enough, they did work. With the attack boost, a single struggle took up more than half of Braviary's HP, so once I got two turns in a row, I just used it twice and that was that. For winning, I got the ability to fly using Braviary, and I used it to fly to the item I needed to get. I encountered this guy on top, who climbed all the way up and then immediately jumped off, telling me not to do the same because only he was cool enough. But of course, he forgot that the protagonist is the one defeating all the huge noble Pokemon, so a short fall like this wasn't a pro- After coming back from the hospital, I decided not to head to the next story destination just yet. Believe it or not, the win against Braviary actually guaranteed that Magikarp had made it through the Icelands. The next battle was the Noble Battle, where I don't have to use Magikarp. But soon after the Noble Battle ends, the story enters into its final act, and you can't get back to town for a while. Although you can still buy many items, this meant that it would soon be much harder to stock up on certain supplies I'd need for the upcoming parts of the game. So I decided to get all of my preparations out of the way now so I'd be ready. I started by completing the final quest for the general store, unlocking the last set of items. 
For me, the important two items this unlocked were Ultra Balls and Full Restores. Since I'd already reached the highest rank I needed to finish the game, I didn't need many Ultra Balls, but there are some battles towards the end of the game that can be won by catching the Pokemon instead of having to defeat them, so I wanted to be able to do that. But the main two things I wanted to stock up on were Full Restores and Ox Power Guards. Like I mentioned before, Full Restores fully restore your Pokemon's HP while also curing their status effects. Since Magikarp had gotten burned, paralyzed, and poisoned in more and more battles as the playthrough went on, I definitely wanted to be able to cure those. And at this point, Ox Power Guards were basically a necessity. The last few battles in the Icelands were already grueling even with the Power Guards I had left, and when the buffs wore off, they got ridiculous. So I wanted to make sure I wouldn't run out, and that meant making a ton of them. Luckily, now that I was so close to the end of the game, I could buy every material I needed to make them. So I ran through the Celestica ruins over and over to build up my money by collecting the items in the crates and chests. The items they had were usually decently valuable, but the best part was that they sometimes contained nuggets, which are worth 10,000 Poké Dollars each. After farming there for quite a while, I eventually built up a stock of 100 full restores and 50 Ox Power Guards. I decided that was more than enough to last me until I could make it back to town. With that out of the way, I headed back to the Icelands. As I mentioned, the next battle is actually just a noble fight, so I won no problem. And with that, Magikarp somehow made it through all five areas in the game. Things were somehow looking up. After heading back to town, I finally refused to eat any more potatoes and was banished from the village as a result. After joining forces with Volo and Adamin, my next objective was to take on the three trials at the lakes. Each of these trials basically consists of a battle against an alpha Pokemon. These can be caught, and I was hoping to save items and make things easier by doing it that way, but I wasn't getting very lucky, so I ended up just draining Splash's PP three separate times and battling each of them. This meant I had to use full restores and Ox Power Guards, but this is why I prepared them in advance. After winning the third trial, I finished the red chain and now had access to the village again. That meant I could stock up on items more easily again. But I still had plenty for the moment, so after saluting Akari for all the potatoes she had to take in my absence, I headed to Mount Coronet to stop the commander. Before I could get to the commander though, first I had to fight the game's true villain, the angry McDonald's employee who's been stuffing people with potatoes since the very beginning. To my surprise, this battle wasn't very difficult at all. He has four Pokemon, and they're all decently powerful, but as long as I kept Ox Power Guard active and kept Magikarp healed up, there wasn't much of a problem. I also got plenty of chances to go twice in a row, so I had plenty of openings to heal, buff, or attack. The only thing I really had to pay attention to was making sure Magikarp's HP was high before defeating a Pokemon, so the next one couldn't defeat it immediately. It still took a few attempts, including one where I definitely would have won if I didn't get risky with recoil damage, but it was a fairly easy battle as long as I kept Magikarp's HP topped up. After beating him, he left me with one final potato-based threat. You guys thought I was joking, I'm not. <laughs> After winning the battle, I noticed that Magikarp had been fully healed, including Splash's PP. This was kind of concerning to me. Early on in the game, when I got healed before fighting the Alpha Krikatoon, I drained my PP before fighting it, but it healed me again when I actually started the battle. If that was the case here, then the next battle would become ridiculous. After draining Splash's PP, I headed to the summit. Fortunately for me, when I faced off with Kamado, I found that Splash's PP was still gone. And if you can believe it, this battle was even easier than the last one. Braviary was up first. This one didn't have Roost, which was good, but it did enough damage that I couldn't safely attack very often. Also, although the turn counter kept indicating that I'd have multiple turns in a row, Braviary kept using moves that changed that, and I only ever got single turns against it. But I kept Magikarp healed up, kept Ox Power Guard active, and eventually I found enough opportunities to safely attack and took it out. Snorlax was up next, and it was so slow that I'd sometimes get three turns in a row, which made defeating it very easy. Golem did enough damage that I had to be a bit careful, but it went down as well. Clefable was last, and although I felt like I was doing fine just by keeping Magikarp buffed and healed up, I did end up losing to a critical hit. But the fight was clearly possible, and I did it just a few attempts later. The strategy didn't really need any changing, Clefable just didn't get any critical hits that time, so I managed to win. After defeating Kamado, it was time for a fight against Dialga. Magikarp had gotten fully healed, so I couldn't use Struggle. But fortunately for me, I actually didn't need to this time. All I had to do was throw Ultra Balls at it over and over until I caught it, and just like that, the fight was over. <laughs> Palkia appeared next, but before I could fight it I had to get my hands on the Origin Ore, and to get that I had to do the final trainer battle of the main story. So after throwing Dialga into the boxes, I went and drained Splash's PP. The Bandit Charm was the final trainer of the main story, and she was even easier than Kamado. She only had two Pokemon, and they didn't deal too much damage. I didn't need to come up with any special strategies. I kept Ox Power Guard active, kept Magikarp healed, and I attacked. After getting the Origin Ball made back in town, I headed back to the summit, where Kamado forced me to add Dialga to my party for the battle. You might think I'd have to set some rule like only allowing myself to use Magikarp and resetting the game if it fainted, and while I would do that, it actually doesn't matter at all in this case, because the Palkia fight actually works like the Noble fights, so I didn't need to use Dialga or Magikarp at all. And that meant that after dodging its attacks and throwing bombs at it, I managed to take Palkia down. 
And believe it or not, that's the end of the story. After defeating Palkia, the game ends on a happy note and the credits roll. So while I'm not sure I would say I'm happy to announce this, I can confirm that you can indeed beat Pokemon Legends Arceus using a party containing just a single Magikarp. I legitimately did not think it was going to be possible when I started. I had hoped that I could get far enough to make an interesting video out of it, but I was genuinely shocked that it actually was possible to beat the game like this. But, of course, this isn't actually the end of the adventure. Because if you've played this game or seen other videos on it, then you'll know that the post-game storyline leads into the story's real hardest battle. And I had to see just how far Magikarp could go. In the post-game, you team up with Volo to collect the rest of the plates you obtained throughout the game. To get the first one, I had to enter my first post-game battle. An Alpha Vespiquin was waiting for me in the Fieldlands. Fortunately, I can catch it, so rather than draining Splash's PP and trying to fight it, I just threw Ultra Balls at it until it stayed in, allowing me to collect a plate. Kogita gave me the locations of the other plates, and I now had to collect the rest of them. Back in town, Kamado asked me to come to Prelude Beach, where the game began. Defeating him gets me one of the plates, so it's something I would have to do eventually, but that battle could be a major problem for reasons that I'll explain a bit later. I decided to save that one for last and get the other plates first. Luckily for me, all of the other plates are obtained by catching legendary Pokemon. What this meant is that although I had to enter into battles against them, I had the option to start throwing Ultra Balls as soon as the battle started. And that meant that with some luck, I could catch all of them immediately and avoid needing to fight any of them with Magikarp. So... With that done, I had one more plate to get my hands on. Kamado was waiting for me by the beach, and he has a team of 5 Pokemon at level 65 and 66. That wouldn't be too much of a problem on its own. I'm sure it would probably be a tough battle, but it's a very similar team to the one he uses on Mount Coronet, so I wouldn't have been too worried about the battle. The problem is where the battle takes place. Prelude Beach is part of the Jubilee Village area, and in Jubilee Village there are no wild Pokemon. That meant that there was no easy way for me to drain Splash's PP for the fight. And as I mentioned before, transitioning between areas fully heals your team, so I couldn't drain Splash's PP somewhere else and then come back. So it seemed like if I wanted to drain Splash's PP, I'd have to not only survive long enough to use Splash 40 times against Kamado, but also survive the rest of the battle after that once Struggle became available. And it's not like that meant I just had to survive 40 turns. I would also have to heal Magikarp as Kamado's Pokemon attacked it. So it seemed like I'd probably have to wait more than 50 turns before I could start dealing damage at all, let alone winning the fight after that. And in case you're wondering, yes, you do actually have to win the battle to proceed. I tried to come up with easier ways to drain Splash's PP. My first thought was that maybe I could use Ingo. If you talk to Ingo, you can get him to call various characters so you can battle against them. I thought that maybe I could call someone, drain Splash's PP until Magikarp fainted, then revive it and do that again, and continue until Splash was out of PP. However, when Magikarp fainted, I discovered that it got fully healed after losing, so this option was out. However, after thinking about it for a while, I came up with a solution. As you might have noticed if you've been looking closely at the gameplay footage, throughout the playthrough I didn't do too many side quests, and that meant that the vast majority of them were still available to do. I took a look at all of them, and out of the 94 quests available in the base game, one of them held the key to solving this problem. Quest 88, Steely Lucario. In this quest, you battle against a single Lucario in the village training grounds. This was the perfect opportunity. If I only had to contend with one Pokemon, it would be a lot easier to drain Splash's PP and then heal Magikarp's HP before the Kamado battle. The only problem is that the Lucario battle is part of this side quest. Once you beat it, the quest is complete and it's gone for good. So I had to be 100% sure that when I finished battling the Lucario, I was completely prepared to head directly to Kamado. If I saved the game after the Lucario battle and didn't have enough items to get through the Kamado battle, then it was over. So I had to be very careful. After all the item grinding I had done earlier on, I still had 28 full restores and 26 ox power guards. I decided to farm money again until I had 100 full restores and 40 ox power guards. I felt almost certain that this would be enough to get me through the Kamado battle safely. After collecting the items, I started the Lucario quest. The battle went on for a long time, and eventually, Lucario actually ran out of PP and ended up defeating itself with Struggle's recoil damage. I had gotten Splash's PP down to 4 when Lucario fainted, which felt fine. It's not like I had a better alternative, and getting rid of 4 PP in the Kamado battle will not be anywhere near as ridiculous as having to get rid of 10 times that amount. So, with Splash's PP mostly drained, I headed back to Kamado, satisfied that I'd come up with a solution to the problem. I entered the battle, and... So, after all that, it turned out that this battle was actually one of the ones that heals you when you start it. There was no way to check this beforehand because there was no other way for me to drain Magikarp's strength in town, but now that I knew, it meant that I really did have no choice but to drain all of Splash's PP in this battle. And as you would expect, this fight was ridiculous. Kamado opened with Golem, and it had Thunder Punch, which is super effective against Magikarp and took out a huge chunk of its HP. 
It didn't always use it, but I knew that if it got a critical hit, it would almost definitely take out Magikarp. So to try avoiding that, I had to make sure Magikarp's buff never went away, I had to make sure I kept him healed up at almost all times, and during all of this, I also had to try and find openings where I could use Splash to drain its PP. Eventually, Golem seemed like it had used up all the PP for all of its moves except Iron Head, which wasn't very effective. He used that for several turns, which made things much easier for me, but then when it ran out of PP for Iron Head, Kamado called it back and switched to Braviary, and suddenly I had to deal with that thing's attacks, which also took out huge chunks of Magikarp's HP. And remember, during all of this, I was just waiting for the opportunity to be able to attack him at all. The entire battle so far had just been me working towards the point of having the ability to attack, and if Magikarp fainted at any point, I'd have to restart. But eventually, Braviary seemed like it had also run out of PP for its strong moves, because it started spamming Quick Attack over and over. I kept Magikarp buffed and healed just in case Braviary stole some PP on its strong moves, but these quick attacks were what finally let me get Splash's PP down to zero. And so, finally, I could start to fight back. Braviary ran out of PP on the exact same turn as Magikarp, but after using Struggle for a few turns, Kamado switched it out too, this time into Clefable. Now that I could actually attack, things became more normal. I played very cautiously, and although it took some time, I eventually beat Clefable and Snorlax by keeping Magikarp's HP up and buffs active while looking for two turn openings. Heracross was up next, and it was really scary. It buffed itself up, and then used Close Combat. Even with Ox Power Guard active, this hit for more than half of Magikarp's HP. If I didn't have the buff up, I almost certainly would have lost. I had to make certain Magikarp was completely healed up, while also making absolutely certain that the buff never went away. If I failed at either of those things, then a close combat would almost definitely take out Magikarp in one hit. Now, as you can probably imagine, at this point, I was pretty on edge. <laughs> This battle had already taken over 40 minutes, and if I lost, I would have to do it all over again. If Heracross got a critical hit, that would probably be it. But Magikarp must have sensed my stress, because when I finally had my first opening to attack, he got a critical hit and destroyed Heracross in one attack. And, although I could hardly believe it, taking down Heracross meant that I'd won the battle. Kamado's last two Pokemon were the Golem and Braviary he'd switched out earlier, who had already used up the PP for all of their moves. So I didn't even bother attacking. I just healed every turn and watched as they defeated themselves for me. And somehow, after almost an hour-long battle and hours of preparation, I'd managed to beat Kamado on my first attempt. After the battle, Kamado handed over the plate he had. Since I had now collected all of the plates Kogita told me about, the next story mission opened up, so I headed back to her house. After getting a plate from her, I was directed to the Temple of Sinnoh. That's where the real final battle takes place, but I knew for a fact that I was not ready for that yet. Before I fought Lucario, I had 100 full restores and 40 ox power guards. I now had 25 full restores and 11 power guards left, meaning I'd used 75 full restores and 29 power guards across those two battles. So there was no way I was going to be winning the final battle without stocking back up one final time. So after farming for quite a while, I eventually got together 200 full restores and 100 ox power guards. If this wasn't enough to get me through one single battle, then I had to imagine that it probably wasn't possible anyway. And so, after draining Splash's PP again, I headed to the summit. Vola revealed himself to be the game's true villain, and challenged me to my final battle. And so, Magikarp's final trial began. Volo's first Pokemon was a Spiritomb. This one went down pretty easily. Magikarp had plenty of chances to go twice in a row, so it was easy enough to heal and buff, or heal and attack. Roserade was next. Uh-oh. <laughs> So here's what the situation was. In every attempt I did, Spiritomb went down easily, and then Roserade was always next. And no matter what I did, even with the Power Guard active, Petal Dance always destroyed Magikarp in one hit. I had one attempt where it missed, so I decided to throw Caution to the Wind and use Struggle twice. This did take out the Roserade, but left Magikarp at just 1 HP. Obviously, the Lucario he sent out next defeated Magikarp immediately, but at the very least, this proved that if Roserade missed, I did have a chance here. However, it quickly became clear that that was my only chance. On one attempt, I made sure to get Magikarp's HP to completely full while it was buffed, and Roserade's strong style Petal Dance still beat it in one hit, so there was no way to survive a hit from Petal Dance. Every Petal Dance had to miss, or I lost. Across Volo's entire team, Petal Dance was the only move that was super effective on Magikarp. If I could just get past Roserade with HP to spare, there was a chance. After throwing myself at the battle over and over for a while, I finally got the luck I needed. I knew I didn't really have time to spare against Roserade, so I had to play a little risky and swing at it with Struggle. To my surprise, even though Magikarp's HP was in the yellow, Roserade chose to use Spikes instead of Petal Dance, giving me the chance to swing at it once more and take it out. The recoil damage, plus the damage from Spikes, left Magikarp at just 16 HP. Better than before, but not by much. I knew that Lucario would take me out immediately, but then it used Bulk Up instead, raising its stats and dealing no damage to Magikarp. Lucario spammed Close Combat after buffing its stats. This did a ton of damage, but if Magikarp's HP was full, it could just barely survive, even without Ox Power Guard active. 
close combat only has 5 PP, so I just hoped that he wouldn't get a critical hit and healed and buffed Magikarp to stall turns. Once close combat ran out, I was able to carefully take out the Lucario by continuing to keep Magikarp healed and buffed. Togekiss was up next, and it opened with Calm Mind, which raises attack and defense. The situation became very similar to the Lucario one. It spammed Moonblast over and over, with each hit taking out more than half of Magikarp's HP when Power Guard was active. However, once its buff wore off, it didn't put it back up again for some reason, which made things a little less scary. Eventually, I did manage to take it out, but Magikarp's HP was low enough that the Arcanine he sent out next used an Agile-style combo to defeat it, which was really disappointing after how far I'd gotten. As you can probably tell, this fight, even more than the others, required a huge amount of luck to get through. Even the attempt where I got to Arcanine only came about because of pure luck, so if I wanted to have a chance of making it through to the end of the battle, I had to tip luck in my favor. So I started farming money again. Why did I need more money? Because after buying the recipe back in town, I could buy the materials to craft Ox Evasions. Ox Evasion is another buff item like the Ox Power Guards, but this one makes your Pokemon more evasive for 5 turns, so that moves miss them more often. Since my entire strategy relied on Roserade missing its attacks, this was my best bet. I made 25 of these, and then headed back to the summit. Obviously, these items just made it so that the odds were in my favor a little bit more. Getting past Roserade still relied entirely on luck, but I hoped that this would start to make things feel more feasible. Before too long, the benefits became very apparent. A few attempts in, and I got on a run where Roselia started missing frequently. I did still lose on that attempt, because my HP was too low to survive Lucario's attack, but it was clear that the Ox Evasions were going to be helpful in getting Magikarp past Roselia, so I kept trying. Finally, after hours of attempts, I finally had another attempt where I managed to take out Roserade, and then Magikarp just barely survived a close combat from Lucario. From there, I was able to fight my way through his team again using the same approach as the first time. However, once I got to Togekiss, I changed strategies. In my last attempt that got this far, I lost because I attacked it when my HP wasn't full, and the recoil damage from Struggle left Magikarp's HP low enough that Arcanine was able to take it out immediately. So this time, I played it ridiculously safe. If Magikarp wasn't buffed and its HP wasn't completely full, I refused to attack at all. Across 10 entire minutes, I attacked 4 times total. <laughs> If Magikarp was missing even the smallest amount of HP, I healed it. And if Togekiss had Calm Mind active, even if Magikarp's HP was full already, I wasted turns by using Ox Power Guards and Ox Evasions even when they were already active, just so that I could keep Magikarp's HP full. This meant that Togekiss alone took 20 minutes, but eventually it ran out of PP. Volo switched to Garchomp next, and although this seemed scary, it was actually very easy. It didn't have any moves that buffed its stats, and its attacks didn't do much damage. If Magikarp was buffed, I was actually able to take the recoil damage from Struggle, then take a hit from Garchomp, and still be just fine. I took it out at completely full HP with the buff still active. Arcanine came out next, and this time Magikarp's HP was high enough to survive its opening combo. Its Rock Slide did quite a bit of damage, so I just stalled with heals until it ran out of PP, and the move it started using after that, Raging Fury, was a Fire-type move that did very pathetic damage. So I was able to attack it, and days after my previous good attempt, I finally got my revenge. And at this point, Volo only had Togekiss left, who was entirely out of PP. So like with Kamado, I was able to heal my way to victory while it did next to no damage to Magikarp. And so, with 200 HP left on Magikarp, Togekiss took itself out. And after days of trying and hours of attempts, I'd finally beat Volo's team. But of course, the battle wasn't actually over yet. Immediately after the battle against Volo's actual team of 6 finishes, he calls out Garatina for the final section of the fight. You have to fight both forms of Garatina, both with their own pool of HP and PP, which means this is basically a fight against 8 Pokemon, 2 of them legendaries. Also, although you have to fight all 8 of them in a row, after you defeat Volo's team of 6, there's a cutscene before the Garatina battle starts. This essentially means it's a second battle. You don't get healed, but your buffs do disappear. This meant that when the battle against Garatina's first form started, Magikarp had no buffs. Fortunately, at level 100, Magikarp had enough speed to move first. Even though Magikarp was missing 25 HP, I decided to use an Ox Power Guard instead of healing. To my surprise, Magikarp survived Garatina's attack. I quickly found out that although Garatina definitely did a lot of damage, it wasn't anything too insane to handle. Garatina was absolutely easier than the Roselia. Unfortunately, after taking out 6 Pokemon in a battle that took me over a full hour, I misclicked, attacked Garatina with Struggle, and got defeated. Luckily for me, just 30 minutes later I got past Roselia safely again, and then it was back to Garatina. I started the battle by using a Power Guard on my first turn again. Garatina got a critical hit, which was very encouraging, but I did manage to survive and heal up. But as you can imagine, after attempting this fight for so long, I was pretty scared to lose at this point. So much so that I spent every turn healing. Garatina didn't give very many 2 turn openings, which meant the Power Guard buff sometimes ran out. Even then, I'd choose to heal instead of using a Power Guard. Garatina would use agile style moves and combos, so I was scared about losing even a small portion of Magikarp's HP. At first I thought that I couldn't possibly keep this up, but pretty quickly I started to wonder about that. 
Even when Magikarp wasn't buffed by Power Guard, it was still able to take Giratina's attacks and heal up. Giratina has a total of 35 PP across all of its moves, which meant that it had 70 PP total across both its forms. I had 130 full restores left, and that was more than enough to outlast Giratina's PP for both forms, plus the extra turns it would spend using Struggle. I was concerned about whether Magikarp could survive attacks from the second form, and I was also concerned about whether it could survive a critical hit, but with the amount of damage Giratina did, I didn't seem to have a better option. So I began stalling. And to my surprise, this strategy worked perfectly. I just healed every single turn, and nothing could kill Magikarp in one go. Earth Power was pretty scary. It had a chance to lower Magikarp's defense for three turns, and if it did, it meant that a critical hit would almost definitely take it out. Fortunately, the defense drop only happened once, and Garatina didn't get a critical hit during that period. Slowly but surely, Garatina drained its PP, and eventually it started to use Struggle. When it did, I took the chance to use both a Power Guard and an Ox Evasion to make the start of the second phase a little easier, and then kept Magikarp healed up until it went down. Next up was Garatina's Origin form. Like I mentioned before, this form has its own pool of HP and PP. It definitely hit harder than the first form, but I just kept healing and hoping. And, if you can believe it, it worked. None of its moves did enough damage to defeat Magikarp, no matter which one it used. It even got a critical hit at one point, and still Magikarp managed to survive. Turn after turn, I just healed and healed, and eventually, after the scariest battle I've ever done in Pokémon, the Origin form ran out of PP too. After a few more turns of healing it took itself out with Struggle, and after hours of attempts, I finally beat Volo. And with that, somehow, the playthrough was complete. I can hardly believe I'm saying this, but yes, you can beat the entire game using just a Magikarp. After defeating Volo, you can complete the Pokedex, and when you do that, you can fight Arceus. But that fight is just like the Noble fights, so it makes zero difference whether you use Magikarp or a full team of Legendaries if you're not sending out your Pokémon. And I think this video has gone on for long enough. The Arceus fight is 100% easily doable as well. And so, after more than 999 splashes, the journey was complete, and that meant there was only one thing left to do.